Ernest Hemingway. A name that when students first hear it, they either go, uh, or they may go, Woo! Yes! Let's talk about what is said and not said in this piece, what is ultimately very popular to assign to high school students today. Watch the end to find out whether we groan or moan. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I am White Elephant Crypto. And if you are new to the Codex Cantina, we go heavy into the literature that we read, trying to bring out the hidden meanings. If you are down for discussions like that, please make sure you hit the subscribe button. And as always, we start off with publication information, Hills Like White Elephants was published in August 1927 in the literary magazine Transition, but then was later published again in 1927 in a short stories collection, Men Without Women. And we'll leave a link down in the description below where you can listen for free. Now, Mr. Crypto, have you heard of what SEO means? Something else. Elephant ordinary. <laughs> Special ordinary elephant. It is something that Google uses. It's it's the idea of how do I make sure people end up at the right pages? And it's called search engine optimization. But it's the idea that there's a whole bunch of stuff happening behind the pages in terms of what pictures are named, what, what metadata is on those pictures that drive people to the information that they don't actually see. Oh, yeah. We did a thing at this at school once where a guy came and talked to us about Google and everybody like searched for dogs and like cat people got different stuff than like dog people because like the computers knew about your preferences. It was crazy. The engine is complex, but what is not complex is Hemingway's writing. It's the idea that there are unseen hidden parts that you can't see in the same way that Google works. You have what's presented on the surface level with Hemingway in terms of minimal dialogue, minimal text. It's very simple and plain, but what's moving is all the unsaid pieces behind the scenes. What it is is Hemingway is wanting you, the reader, to fill in a lot of the value and interpretation as to what is what he means in these pieces. Okay, that kind of helps me feel a little bit better about reading this piece and being like, what, what, what? Yeah, I imagine when most people pick up this this text and they read it, it's just like, that's it? Like, that's all there is? There's just two people talking? They don't even mention what the heck they're talking about? Well, what it is, is he's really just plopping you almost into the middle of a story. There's a fa very famous reference that says, like, his first novel that when he was getting ready to submit it, that he just chopped the first 70 pages, just, just cut it off and inserted you right into the middle of a scene. And that's kind of what you feel like with this story where there's no there's no intro, there's no outro. You're just plump in the middle of a chapter even for for what this story is trying to convey. Yeah, I definitely think I need to uh, teach Mr. Hemingway how to write context. <laughs> well, arguably, that's also kind of what he's going for is he gives you the bare bones and is expecting you to fill in the rest. So if you feel lost... I think you just need to kind of spend a little bit more time and effort into digging in what could, what, why this word choice and why did he put this there and what could this possibly mean? Because everything that he could strip away, he did. Yeah, and I think that's why I struggled with Hemingway for so long. We've talked about it before on the channel and in private that I wasn't a big fan, but until we've kind of had these conversations, it really has allowed me to start enjoying his pieces, realizing why he's doing what he's doing. Because otherwise, you are going to be frustrated and maybe not enjoy a piece as much. So let's go into the plot and then the analysis real quick. For plot, a man and a woman are at a station amongst some rolling hills that are white. They talk about whether to have an operation. The man repeatedly tells her she doesn't have to if she doesn't want to. The woman feels intense or overwhelmed and pleads for him to please, 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 please stop. They both want to be happy. The girl says she's fine. End plot. And that's really all there is that's kind of here. Now, in terms of analysis, there's a lot more, like we talked about with that iceberg theory, there's a lot more under the covers and behind the scenes that's really pushing the tension in this piece that I think anyone reading this can just, they've been in those moments where they can feel and insert themselves into those really intense moments where people want to say something and it's on, it's on the cusp of their tongues, but they're not actually saying what they want to. Yeah, I know when reading this piece, I was definitely uh, a little bit flabbergasted and I know that I felt the intensity between these two people having this very simple conversation because I didn't know what was going on. If I knew what was going on, maybe it would have been more intense or less. I don't know, but it definitely is something that's going to get you one way or the other. The first pass is, huh? 
But then the second yeah. pass, you start to unpack some of the things that are happening here. So let's talk about this. First of all, did you have an age associated with these two individuals? Yeah, so I know that a lot of people go that they're probably not similar in age, but I feel like they're both very young. But then you can make the argument because of the operation part of the conversation that takes place. Sometimes you flip to say, oh, maybe they're old because they don't want the operation. I don't think it's ever clear their ages. And I think you can make an argument for all three options. Yeah, I think the man is clearly called the man, which can imply at least some maturity. But you don't know if that's in terms of age or mentality. And then the woman is Jig, who's the only character named in this piece. Arguably Jig like a jigsaw, too. But she's also just referred to as the girl, which could imply either a younger age or at least younger mentality. So it's kind of up for you, the reader, to imply those. But what about the setting? Did you notice that the setting with quotes like, there was no shade and no trees, and the station was between two lines of rail in the sun? Yeah, for such a short piece, I feel like that the setting is almost a character on its own, where you as the reader are shaded from information and you only get kind of that ray of light or that ray of information towards the very end, you're still kind of confused of what happened, what's going to happen, because there is no conclusion to the story. And then the station itself is these two people going in different directions in their lives or possibly want to go in different directions in their lives. It's a genius setup, but very, very subtle. And then they start moving into choices very quickly where the girl asks him, what should we drink? It's pretty hot, the man said. Let's drink beer. So our, op <laughs> our opening exchange very quickly brings up the concept of choices in this piece. And you'll notice that it's the girl pushing for alcohol. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, alcohol is kind of that idea of people having to make tough decisions. Like when, when you're distraught, you sometimes drink and maybe it doesn't necessarily lower your inhibitions, but releases some calm so you have a better understanding of yourself, the situation to perhaps make a big decision in life. And it depends on how you want to take it, but you'll notice the, the woman asks for basically a drink that is kind of like absinthe and she describes it as licorice, which it does have that taste, but at the same time, describing it as licorice is very innocent, almost returning to a childhood-like state as opposed to the more adult alcoholic beverage that is more for more mature audiences. You're starting to see a little bit more of the the, the barren landscape with the escape and, and briefness of information from the sun, along with the childhood-like innocence of licorice candy being compared with the adult maturity of absinthe that they're potentially ordering. And I know this was over 100 years ago, but I also feel like maybe if uh, they or she or he was more mature, they probably wouldn't be drinking alcohol with the situation that they're in. I think that's actually very common for, I think, a lot of students to go down that route, but that's actually anachronistic for what we knew at the time. Let's come back to that once we discuss more of this operation here, but that's actually a little bit of a, a faulty thought uh, to be going down that line. So, so you got to keep girl... in mind that you're in 1920s. Right. So the girl, the girl brings up the hills and she says, they look like white elephants, she said, which has a double meaning. Okay. White elephants. The story is called hills like white elephants. First of all, are you familiar with the term the elephant in the room? Yeah. So this is something that is a big deal that you don't want to talk about, or it's something that you need to talk about. And do you know what a white elephant is? So the white elephant idea of like the white elephant gift exchange at Christmas where you're getting a gift that you don't want. So they're making a big decision, something they don't want to talk about over something that they don't want. And it's a choice that they're making is basically all of this behind the scenes movement that Hemingway is putting into this piece. But on the surface, all you're getting is these dialogue of like, do you want some alcohol? This tastes like licorice. It's, it's very interesting the way that Hemingway's style is so sparse from a journalistic standpoint on the surface, but there's a lot of tension and stuff that you feel behind the scenes. Yeah, because the whole time I'm thinking, what are they talking about? What's going on? Like, it, this seems very, very ah, confusing. What, what What's happening? And that all kind of comes down to the line drop, right? When the man says, it's really an awfully simple operation, Jig, the man said. It's not really an operation at all. And I think for Whoa. a lot of first-time readers, most people are like, who's a mawazaha? What, what, what operation are they talking about? Oh, they're talking about that operation. That's some pretty heavy topics. 
you might want to order another beer. <laughs> so some people may still not even be sure with which operation they're speaking of. I want to give this little I want to give this little exchange here, which is interesting because we have the man starting with saying, we can have the whole world. No, we can't. We can go everywhere. No, we can't. It isn't ours anymore. It's ours. No, it isn't. And once they take it away, you never get it back. But they haven't taken it away. Well, wait and see. Come on back in the shade, he said. You mustn't feel that way. So when I first wrote this down, I had no problem contextually in my mind keeping track of who said what. And when I look back at my notes getting ready to go over this talk today, I was like, who said which part again? Like, <laughs> like, like there's almost no dialogue tags because Hemingway is just stripping this story of anything he can take out where you don't absolutely need it. I think he's doing that because he's pulling away the identity of these people, of this choice that they're having to make. Because once you give something a label then it makes it a lot more difficult to make a deep decision like that. Well, I think this exchange comes down to the they. And once they take it away, you never get it back. But they haven't taken it away. Who is the they that they're talking about? And you realize very quickly that they're talking about the next generation, and they're talking about kids. And that's when you realize that the elephant in the room is that this woman is potentially pregnant, and they're talking about not having the baby anymore and whether to go through the operation to perform said activity. So when you get that line drop, you finally realize that this whole story is about these two people having this conversation and they're trying to communicate of what they're going to do with a big choice in their life. And we have a quote from the story that says, come on back in the shade, he said, you mustn't feel that way. And I think that he's trying to pull her away from the decision of possibly moving forward uh, and starting a family. Well, he's absolutely manipulating her, right? With with He's pretending that he's the martyr where he's saying, I'm perfectly willing to go through with it if it means anything to you, right? Like, he's like trying to pretend that he's laying down on the cross, but like, you know, for her. Yeah, he's definitely pulling on her heartstrings and a little bit our naivety as well, I believe. And that's where we kind of come back to that circle of maybe there is an age gap between these two individuals. Well, and then it leads to that line where she says, will you please, 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 please stop talking. And that's just when... <laughs> You know, anyone that's been in these arguments before knows that moment where you literally can't say anything. Like, you have hit the wall, you've pushed your luck as far as it can go, and at this point, there just needs to be some space to think about what was said. And she comes back and says, I'm fine. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, as a reader, you have to interpret that. Is, is her saying she's fine, actually she's fine? Or how many times are you in an argument and you just don't want to deal with it anymore and you're just like, it's fine. And the fine means you're not fine. <laughs> oh, my my wife hates when I say that because she knows that I'm deep down very upset. I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm okay. Like, that means I'm not fine. I'm not okay. Which really just means you just don't want to talk about it anymore. Yep, 100%. Yep, I'm fine. Done. That means I'm done. One of the things that I kind of want to bring up is just kind of like masculinity overriding femininity when it comes to Hemingway. Because when he was a child, a lot of people like to point to this was he actually had to wear a lot of, of his sister's clothes in terms of dresses and dressing like a woman. And a lot of people think that that impacted Hemingway in a way where he was almost kind of embarrassed in shame to the point where he's almost compensating with pushing his masculinity so hard with his horse racing and with his, you know, his, his uh, bowling and hunting. He did all of these activities almost out of a childhood revulsion of being put into this feminine role that he overcompensates it with masculinity. And I would say that this story is actually kind of a very interesting piece where you see him trying to, in the same way with a horse, you, you know, when you're steering it, you, you, you pull on which way you want the horse to go. And then the horse will respond, right? And that's kind of what Hemingway does with his male characters, is that he constantly has them trying to drive other characters, male or female. But they're trying to almost ride and perfect their masculinity override onto other characters. And I think you see that in this piece with this man. He's not saying, you shouldn't do this. He's saying, you shouldn't do this if you didn't want to. I mean, I'd be fine either way. Either way. 
And that's not a way to actually communicate things. Like that's very clearly stating that this man's trying to drive this woman a specific way. And ultimately you can try to tell the horse where to go, but it's the one ultimately in control and can really make the decision. And so this man is projecting his insecurities and bravado, just like Hemingway of saying, you can do X, Y, and Z. I'm fine with it, but not really. It, it's a genius. It's, it's, it's very, very subtle. And I love how it conveys real life sometimes. This is definitely a text where I'm not saying you've been in this situation, but you've been in a difficult conversation where there was an elephant in the room and you wanted the other person to do something, but you know, maybe you were a little bit manipulative in how you, you push them a specific way. You know, a, another way to think about this is where are they? They're in Spain, which is a heavily Catholic area. So that could potentially be another reason as to why they're, they're leading somewhere, why they're at a train station. You know, these rails are very clearly either you go back the way you came and kind of give up or you move forward with what your decision was. So the railroad also kind of represents that decision of Spain being heavily Catholic area would not condone the activity that these two are kind of potentially about to be embark upon. Yeah, we've talked a lot about different stories, how the relationships work between people and how influential religion can be and that this man may have something else in his life. And he's like, oh, man, I, I've got to deal with this issue uh, because it potentially could alter his life in a negative sense. And he's trying to get this young lady, possibly older woman. We don't, they're, we, they're not married, right? We don't know a lot of information. And I, I love how Hemingway has, you know, concocted this story together. We're going to leave a link to our Hemingway playlist down below to check out other Hemingway chats. If you are enjoying this conversation, we'd certainly appreciate the shares in the comments down below. Crypto, let's move into our subjective ratings on this one. What are you going to give this one? What do you think I'm going to give this one? Am I going to give the eye roll groan or am I going to give the woohoo? <laughs> I think I, I think you're probably at an eight is my guess. Yeah, I was going to go about an 8.5-ish, right below like the coveted nine. You know, 10 is perfect for me, and I only give those to like two stories ever. So I would say, yeah, solid uh, B plus in their 8.5. I think that there's just so much in the story to digest, and it does hang on kind of that zinger line in the story, you know. But other than that, yeah, it, it can't get much better. And I don't, well... It's not that I don't like Hemingway. I've struggled to appreciate Hemingway. And I think that's why it's so important to have these conversations. So thank you for helping me uh, get an 8.5 for Hemingway. I'll say this. This is probably my fifth or sixth time reading the story. I mean, you usually have to read it in class in high school. I think I read it in college. I think I, gradu I graduated. I read it just for fun. And then here I am reading it again. I've just read it a bunch through my life. This is one that just sticks with you. You know what I mean? Like the first time you read it, you're kind of like, what was it? Like, I don't even know how to feel about it. And you keep coming back to it because you almost want to be like, do I like it or do I hate it? Like, I'm not sure. And this is just one of those strange enigmatic stories that is just a picturesque and perfect delivery of the iceberg theory of stripping away everything from a story that you can, you know, without deconstructing it to the point of it being incomprehensible and then letting the reader really fill in the value, which can be difficult, I feel like, from an initial pass and maybe earlier reader perspective. But it's definitely interesting and challenging. I think I'm going to go with a... It's hard because, you know, trigger warnings will bring it down. Um, it didn't for me, but I'll go with a 9 out of 10. But I understand that the trigger warning could bring some people, you know, straight out of the game. I think if I read this a couple more times or if I'd had the experience with it that you had, I could possibly get up to that nine. It just wasn't quite there for me. Maybe if I'd read this in high school and had some younger discussions about it and then in college, you know, I could have grown with it as well. And I think that speaks volumes to what you have to, you know, put forth to really get the most out of a Hemingway piece. Well, all right, guys, we post episodes twice a week on Monday and Thursday with a bonus one on Tuesdays. If you are down for discussions like that, please make sure you hit the subscribe button to join us. Una out. Peace.